Is too much fat just as bad as too much sugar? I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome back to Dr. Westman Reacts. This is a video interview that was sent to me. Thank you for recommending these and thanks for the feedback of Dr. Ted Naiman. So it comes from a YouTube channel of Lily Kane. I've never heard of Lily before, but I like the style. I like what she's saying. And she's interviewing Dr. Ted Naiman here. I have great respect for Dr. Naiman. He has been using low carb diets for probably just as long as I have, although his pathway is a, he's a family physician, didn't go through the research uh, training that I did and publish papers like I did, but uh, have known him through the years. I've seen Dr. Naiman at meetings. He has a book called The P.E. Diet and has amplified or, or rediscovered and then popularized the idea that there's this protein energy leveraging that occurs. And well, one major limitation is there's never been a prospective randomized trial on that, but that's okay. You can still write books and all. And uh, watching Dr. Naiman's career, he is also now working with Dr. Infeld, the diet doctor out of Sweden. And they've been working on a new iteration of low carb and high satiety eating called Hava. So I'm fascinating to watch that morph as time goes on. But let's see what, why Dr. Naiman says too much fat is just as bad as too much sugar. The food. All right, Dr. Ted Naiman, I wanna talk about how too much fat can be just as bad as too much sugar. And this is something I've tried to explain in several videos, though I think sometimes people like to hear it from a doctor. And I have had this conversation in the past with Dr. Robert Sivas two years ago and Dr. Gabrielle Lyon a year ago, but I think they were being too scientific in how they were explaining it. So I want to just try and keep this conversation as straightforward and easy for people to understand. And I'm sure we're going to end up using the word calories to talk about this topic, though I know that some people will say that you shouldn't use the word calories as it's just a measurement of heat or calories don't matter. And I understand that calories is an arbitrary word and I would rather focus more on the amount of nutrients you're getting from the food, but calories is just the best way and the universal word people use to talk about food intake. So I think we're just gonna use the word calories. Right, and the reality is you have to think about it in terms of carbon atoms. Anytime you ingest carbon atoms, the only way it's leaving your body is when you exhale it. So carbohydrate and hydrocarbon, which is fat, are just these densely packed chains of carbons. So all of your fat and all of your carbs are these super densely packed carbon atoms in these chains, these molecules. But that's only leaving your body when you exhale it. Yes, you can exhale faster and, and get rid of it faster. That's called exercise, people. This is calories, right? If you want to think about it as if you don't like calories because it's an abstract thing and your body doesn't have the calorie sensor, you just think about all the carbon atoms in that fat. That's the tightest packed carbon you can get. Every single one of those things is only leaving your body when you exhale it, otherwise it's stored as fat. And I agree, calories are just completely arbitrary and made up, but think about the carbons, you know? <laughs> well, uh, it's a very interesting explanation. I, I'm not sure it's helpful for me to explain thinking about the carbons, but the, uh, the ATP or energy you get from the fat is higher per, for each molecule and for the, per the weight comparison of fat and carbohydrates. So that, that's technically uh, uh, very correct. And I don't know if that makes sense to you or if that's useful for you. Let me know. Forget calories. Who cares? Right. And you mentioned to release these carbon atoms, people are forced to do to release carbon dioxide when exercising. Now, I think it's reported 67% of people in America don't exercise. And so for that category of people over the years, they eat a high carb or a standard American diet over the years as they continue to not move their bodies, then their blood work gets worse. Their blood becomes more toxic with the excess energy. Blood sugars rise, triglycerides get worse, and they become insulin resistant. Then they hear that a way to lower these blood sugars, give insulin a break, is to try a high fat, low carb diet. They do that and they see success. They lose weight, triglycerides decrease, 
blood sugars go down, insulin comes down, and they say a high fat, low carb diet is awesome, which it can be. But it's not that meat has any magical powers to it. It's that when people eat a very high protein, satiating, very nutrient dense diet, they tend to be very full and naturally under eat, then they lose weight. Though, if this person continues to not exercise, then their basal metabolic rate will drop, metabolism slow down, and they'll hit a weight loss plateau. And this is where Dr. Robert Sivas was saying that he does a lot of blood work and he'll have long-term carnivore, keto, high fat diet patients, like 10 plus year carnivore people saying that their triglycerides are getting worse, blood sugars are getting worse, and their blood markers are moving in the wrong direction. I would say that a main reason for this is because just like if someone's eating a high carb diet and not moving, if someone's eating a high fat diet and sitting on the couch, eventually, once their metabolism slows down, then if they continue to eat, the same amount of food, they'll be eating a calorie surplus. They'll be over consuming food because they're not exercising. So uh, sorry for the, the long, I, I, I like what Lily is saying the, and she's learning from people I learned from. I know Dr. Robert Siwas and so the, the context here, you always have to always consider the source and always consider the context of what someone's talking about. There are clinical uses of low carb keto diets where I, in the clinic, will reverse diabetes, obesity, metabolic issues like that. There's the kind of use for optimizing your gym performance and exercise. Well, that's a different area. And here, now we're talking about a subset of low carb dieters who do a carnivore type of diet, who then over time, the labs start looking, quote, worse. And remember, the worse is in comparison to what? To the typical American, the, the, the carb eaters, the normal range on your lab tests is from carb eaters. And so just to unpack what she said, it's possible that if you eat more fat than you're burning, that you're going to be in that weight storage mode and get the bad effects of weight gain, the extra, the obesity, and get those uh, adverse effects of the fat cells being large, sending out inflammatory signals, things like that. I think that's a reasonable idea. Does that mean it's worse than sugar? Hmm, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, ab I mean, absolutely. I, I love that. So almost everyone is going to eat the calories of a moderately active version of themselves. You're gonna eat the calories of a moderately active version of yourself. If you're not moderately active, you're screwed. You're completely like, you're just gonna steadily get fatter. And exercise is a huge part of the equation. And I have so many patients who get just so obsessed with diet. It's just like diet, diet, diet. You know, they won't eat a tomato, too many carbs. They won't eat a cucumber, way too many carbs. You know, they, they just, they're just so focused and religious on their diet. <laughs> well, hang on. I have some patients who can't exercise. So hang on. You know, you can be metabolically healthy and not, but if you can, great. And this is, again, just kind of a different context because I've been on interviews with Dr. Naiman before and we kind of shared war stories of uh, that I can get someone in a wheelchair to lose weight. You know, they're not doing any exercise. And Ted said, Dr. Naiman said back to me, oh yeah, well, I had a quadriplegic come to me, you know, it was, it was in a stretcher and they lost weight. So he knows you don't have to exercise to lose weight. And this is an interesting change, uh, or no, the context. If we're talking about otherwise, wait, look who the interviewer is and look who the, the people are who are probably following Lily. They're, they're young, they're, they're active, they're, they can hear a message that's different than someone who's 70 years old in my office who can't exercise because of knee pain. So, so I, it's interesting to see Dr. Naiman change to more of a, a, a younger clinical audience here in his, his explanations of things and really exhorting you to exercise. But if you can't exercise, it's okay. Uh, so if you're one of my patients, you have your knee pain, you just can't exercise. Well, there, there are other things. The diet is actually extremely or the most important thing. And then they never exercise at all. And there is no amount of dieting that's going to keep them from overeating calories. We, we have the studies to prove it. So when, 
when you're sedentary, you just automatically eat more than people who are moderately active. So yeah, I, I'm gonna take issue there. Again, it's context dependent. If you're eating carbs, then I, and I've been noticing the language of, of the new company uh, that Dr. Infeld has, uh, it's trying to incorporate more carbs. It's not low carb anymore. It's not, well it is, but not, not overtly. So a new name, a new strategy to get people to eat. I believe they're doing it to broaden the appeal to many more people who will, who will never give up carbs, which, which is a valid thing to do. But here, uh, you don't have to exercise to lose weight. And if you can't ever exercise again, that's okay. You can be very strict and you can actually reduce the amount you eat. Although sometimes it means I have to ask you not to have it eat. Unlearn the three meals a day with snacks and all that. If you're someone with diabetes, you're taught to do that and you have to unlearn some of that socialization or even medical intervention. Well, I have a lot of people who come to me and they're eating like 800, 1000 calories and they'll say, well, Lily, what's the big deal if I'm eating 900 calories? Someone online said that calories don't matter. And sure, but what about nutrients? If you're eating 800 ish calories, what food or what are your meals look like where you're getting in enough vitamin A, choline, copper, iron, selenium, vitamin B6. I don't know what meal someone would be eating that's 800 calories where they're getting all of the micronutrients they need in the right amounts. So I'll try to help my clients reverse diet, eat more food slowly, build their metabolism, not gain weight, but then still get in all of those micronutrients. Well, yeah, I think she has a good point. The ad lib reduction of food intake that happens when you do an ad lib low carb keto diet, the amount of calories zeroes out, oh, I don't know, 1200 to 1500, somewhere in there, pretty much automatically without calorie counting, 12 to 1500 calories per day. And we have done, or others have done in the low carb community, look at the micronutrients and the micronutrient availability if you're eating excellent foods and there's no concern there. So, but uh, uh, the, um, Lily apparently is a trained coach, doesn't have formal medical training. And so I think it's appropriate to have the, the guardrails of, of this uh, area. We, we pretty much um, in the medical world, so we're teaching other doctors, say that if you're under 800 calories a day, somewhere in there, then you wanna be sure to be followed by a doctor. And of course, there's gonna be a wide range of individual differences there. But so um, I think it's appropriate for a dietitian or nutrition coach to have these limitations on uh, what they teach. That their body needs. That is absolutely true. Yeah, the lower your calories, the higher your risk of nutrient deficiency. As you eat more and more calories, you don't have to worry about it as much. You know, it's just not as critical. So that's a very, very good point. And I think we're on the same page as far as you know, build your metabolism, eat nutrient rich foods. Though I think where we differ is I'm team protein. I say, let's eat the protein first. But then I say that people can choose between having either fat for fuel or carbs. Though I usually push people towards doing more fat for fuel because I find that fat fills people up and keeps them full and satiated. And then they're less likely to overeat. Whereas with carbs, totally can lose weight eating carbs, but I find carbs make people hungrier. Like for myself, if I have an apple in like 30 minutes, I'm hungry again. And so if someone's trying to lose weight and they're feeling hungry all of the time, eventually they're likely gonna have a day where they just say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna overeat. I like that. that Protein comes first and you can choose to run your body on carbs or fats. It's your choice. So if you want to run your body on carbs, it means you basically can't burn fat until you're done burning all those carbs. And that's how we teach it in terms of weight loss. So cut the carbs out. What happens is your body starts burning its fat automatically. It's as if you were not eating anything, getting the fat burning because the protein that you eat really doesn't interfere with the fat burning and that's in protein in typical amounts typically consumed. So I like that a lot. The, the, my three rules of, of nutrition to medical students and residents who come through is protein comes first, 
you can uh, run your body on fat or carbs at your choice. And then rule number three is forget about everything else you've been taught about nutrition. Okay, that's a little bit of sarcasm there, but you want to <laughs> really be evidence-based. You know, we're, ma we're made of protein, protein and fat, really. So that's what we need to focus on consuming, not fruit. We're not made of fruit. We're not made of vegetables. It's protein and fat. And so that's why I usually push more people towards the fat for fuel, because I just find it keeps them happily full and less likely to overeat. And, and I, I kind of agree with you on the like, it could be carbs or fats, but a little bit not both. So in a way that's true. You know, you see people on very low fat, high carb diets doing fine, very high carb, low fat diets doing fine. You combine the two, you get into trouble. You know, all of your combinations of carbs and fats together are very hedonic and that's your, all your donuts and your pizza and your candy bars. And they're like, you know, equal amounts of carbon. But however, however, and here's the caveat, all of that is occurring in a low-ish protein space. If you're, you know, 10, 15, 20% protein, yeah, you better keep your carbs and fats separate. These are all low protein scenarios. If your protein is crazy high, boom, protein's 40%, then yeah, carbs and fats exactly straight down the middle, 30, 30, 30% each. I mean, that's what I'm doing. It's like, as long as I keep protein super high, I can eat uh, half my energy calories from carbs and half from fat without even worrying about it. all of your bodybuilders, all of your bikini models. There, if you look at what they're doing, they're just keeping protein insanely high, 30, 35, 40%. And then it's kind of 50, 50 carbs and fats. Insanely high, ridiculously high, 40%. And then, well, that reminds me of the zone diet, which was 40%, 30, 30, 30, or was it 40 carbs, 30, 30. Anyway, why not eat just real foods, uh, keep it simple? That's the method that I teach without having to worry about macros and percentages like this. Like they're usually not going below 20 or 30 percent fat, and they're not going below 20 or 30 percent carb. It's very, you know, 40, 30, 30 is very common bodybuilding split. You know, if you get that protein high, if protein's like the most dominant macro, then you can go right down the middle on carbs and fat. But in a low protein setting, then you're screwed if you're eating carbs and fats together. That's your baked potato with sour cream. You know, that's your tortilla chips or whatever are just like, you know, 40 to 50% carb, 40 to 50% fat, and protein's low at 10% or lower. I think I'm going to have to have a translation to, to help if you're screwed. You're, you're, if you eat something, you're screwed. Well, how long? How long am I screwed? Is it a long term? Is it just for an hour? Is it so? I'm afraid I, I, I'm just commenting on the imprecision of some of the language, and that's the problem zone. And that, that's also, I think, where people get hungry an hour later is when they, eat, you know, something that's very carbonated, carbish, carb, carbly. I don't know if those are words, but that has no protein in it. You know what I mean? Like all your fruit is like. <laughs> well, look at that uh, carbonated, carbly. No, I had someone come back. I taught them a low carb diet. And I don't know if it was the language, the accent, or the person came back. I see people. So I teach and then I see people back to make sure that it's working because often there's some loss of knowledge in the translation or, you know. And I look on the food record that she gave me. I ask everyone to write out what they're eating and drinking when they come in to see me. And I know it's what you're showing. You want me to see what you're eating and drinking. And on there, she was really proud that she was following the diet. And, and I saw, you know, uh, orange juice and potatoes and pasta and rice. And I, so this was not a low carb diet. So I asked, well, I don't know, were you in my class? You know, in a friendly way, but you're not supposed to eat these carbs. And she goes, well, I'm not having any carbonation. It's a low carbonated diet. No, 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 no. So we're not talking about carbonation. We're talking about carbohydrate, and uh, actually, th there is a, a issue if you've had weight loss surgery and your stomach's this big, you can't have carbonation, or the, the stomach actually can explode because of the carbonation in there. So anyway, just another sort of um, it's it's carbs, carbohydrates that we're limiting. It's okay to have carbonation. Low single digit protein percent, and you are hungry an hour later, you know, after you eat an apple. I mean, I eat apples, you know, it's, it, 
lots of weight and volume, lots of fiber, but it, it's a side dish to a ton of protein. And again, so you're getting the idea that Dr. Ted Neiman is not keto anymore, if he ever was. His story, I do remember, I, I read a review of it at a blog that he himself did a low carb or Atkins type diet, changed uh, a lot of his way of eating and became much healthier. And now apparently there, there's a drift toward not being keto, which you know can be healthy and, and I'm not sure of the incremental benefit of being keto all the time. Although as the keto conferences are continuing, we learn more and more about what staying low on the carbs and having, having ketones around can do. It, it's, it, it may be one day that I'll be saying you need to be in ketosis if you want the best outcomes. I can't say that yet. I don't think the science for in humans is to that level, but it's pretty clear Dr. Neiman's uh, talking a car low carb yet uh, not keto level carb and Lily is teaching a carnivore like which is a zero or very super low carb diet so uh, there may be uh, uh, different contexts here proteins always dominant and then you're used to have to worry about it okay I guess another reason why I usually push people towards more fat and protein versus carbs is because I find many people are not moderators and so if I say have a little bit of carbs it turns into a lot of bit of carbs and I think we can kind of see this through just statistically speaking the vast majority of people in the world are obese or diabetic and they didn't get that way by just having an apple a day for many people if I say have one piece of fruit it can turn into 10 pieces of fruit then turn into binge eating on chocolate cake so but now I will have protein and fat for dinner then I'll take a walk around my neighborhood come back and I'll have yogurt and a piece of fruit so I don't know if we're considering that me having protein, fat, and carbs in one sitting, but I know that some people are nervous about the Randall cycle. So yeah, what are your thoughts on the Randall cycle? Well, before we get to that, the idea that you can't control or can't moderate is so common. Again, there's a selection bias of people who end up needing a doctor like me. They, who are, they're unable to control it, even though there is sugar addiction sugar and ultra processed food addiction. And if you're a sugar addict and you keep going back to carbs because of that, you have to wake up one day and say, you know, let me try without it for a month or, or a week or a day. See how you do because it's a, a addict uh, has to give it up entirely. You, they're unable to moderate it. Or you go on to the sugar-free versions of the things you're addicted to, if it's sugar, that is. So I think we're, again, the suction bias. Now that I remember, I, Dr. Naiman's history is not one of needing massive weight loss. So he's selected out, let's say, as someone who has not been a super storer or a carb addict who needed the uh, keto level carb restriction or carnivore level carb restriction. Often we teach other people based on what we've experienced and what we know and, and bringing in your own experience. I resisted doing that for years because it's not about me. And I didn't have any really huge weight loss story as some doctors do. But so I teach based on what other people learned and other, what, and other people's experiences. And some people need that super low level of carb restriction with no apples because one apple leads to 10 apples. Right, right. So <clears throat> anytime you're eating carbohydrate, you're just immediately downshifting fat oxidation until the carbs are all gone. And that's what the Randall cycle is. You have such a tiny amount of storage in your body for carbohydrate that it, as carbs are coming in, fat oxidation has to go down. So you burn all the carbs up and then you go back to burning fat again. And it's just a very nice little seesaw. It's happening so smoothly and perfectly in the background that you don't have to, it doesn't have to be under any kind of conscious control. You don't have to micromanage that with like the order your food's in or anything like that. Your body's going to manage all that for you. You know what I mean? It's just absolutely not a concern. But yes, the Randall cycle does slow down the release and oxidation of fat from your fat cells when carbohydrate is present. It does the same thing if you're drinking alcohol or any other more volatile macronutrient that has a higher oxidative priority because you don't have room to store it. I'm more well, yeah, I don't want you to worry about the Randall cycle. I, uh, it's interesting. So if you're 
if you're learning about chemistry and, and don't know the, the how to put it all together, uh, you know, I want you to not be worried about things, about eating food till you're comfortably full and eat from a certain set of foods. And if you're starting out, I would recommend under 20 total carbs a day because the cravings go away and, and the hunger goes away in just a day or two. You lose one to two pounds of weight loss, uh, have one to two pounds of weight loss per week four to eight per month, 50 to 100 per year. So the context of people coming to me in my clinic is they want it to work the first time, every time I hand out a list of foods that I didn't create, but I studied and published papers on. And the idea of worrying about the biochemistry, it, it, the more we learn about ketosis and or, or uh, you ketonemia is the latest term, meaning it's normal to have ketones in the blood at this level if you don't eat, but that's a big mouthful, you ketonemia, uh, but maybe that, or nutritional ketosis, well, the ceosis still kind of has a connotation of being abnormal. Well, it is abnormal if you compare yourself to those who eat carbohydrates, which is where the, quote, normal range comes from. I'm more worried about the hedonic behavioral part of carbs and fats together. So if I just give somebody plain baked potatoes, they're going to eat like one. But you have a baked potato with, you know, butter and sour cream and bacon. Okay, you're going to eat like twice as much calories. So it's, it's, for me, it's more of the, the taste and the behavior and the hedonic side. And I really don't care about the Randall cycle because your body just takes care of that. That's not something you have to think about consciously. You know what I mean? Okay, so you're more worried about the hedonic behavior, meaning carbs and fats combined together taste really delicious. And so then people tend to overeat when they have palatable, delicious foods. So then if someone has 20 pounds to lose, what would you recommend that person eat to try and lose weight? Well, okay, so first of all, it's all about the protein, right? For me, if you're trying to get leaner, it's all about the protein. Protein should be the focus of every single meal, every single snack. You're centered on the protein. You're focused on the protein. Protein should be the dominant macronutrient. And then, Because we're made of protein. And you know, the interesting thing, I, I do have medical students, residents, doctors from out of town who visit my office, learn what I do. And most people are not, the first thing that comes out of their mouth about what what we're made of. So, so I'll ask, I'll do a little quizzing at the beginning. And if I only have half a day with one of the young doctors, I'll, I'll quiz them a lot. Like, you know, what, what are we made of? And, and it's like people, people in the medical world have not been taught to think quickly about what we're made of. What, meaning what do we have to give ourselves and, and, and you know, then what can't we make on our own? That's another issue, but we're mainly protein. When you look at it, the muscles, the bones, the, the, we're made of protein mainly. So protein comes first. Exactly. Dr. Naaman. And then any carbs or fats are just like coming along for the ride. So you get, in my opinion, a fairly lean protein because it's easy to add more fat or more. So I'm not so quite sure. Well, remember, he's not trying to be in ketosis anymore. So this is a, a moderate carb eater who I, I don't think he mentions me measuring ketosis anymore, but I really doubt with the amount of apples he says he's eating that he'll be in ketosis. But so this is, again, general teaching for an audience who are young, uh, active, and, and can probably eat this way. So this might be actually for your children or grandchildren to say, you know, you don't have to be keto. When, when, when you're so enthusiastic and you share this knowledge, the younger generations don't have the same urgency to make this change. Maybe direct them into this general uh, area of eating less sugar. And uh, this language that you're hearing now might be appropriate. To carbs to it. You know what I mean? Like if I buy, if I have a skinless chicken breast or some sirloin or something, I can always cook it in butter. I can always add heavy cream. I can add cheese. I can very, very, very easily, almost too easily, definitely too easily add a crap ton of fat. Yeah, I don't know. If you have never, <laughs> if you're not in our area in North Carolina, um, City Barbecue brisket, so any brand of brisket that has the fat in it with an edge of, of, of seasonings, I'm happy I eat fatty foods, fatty meat. I have patients who come in who have abdominal obesity. Their fasting insulin might be 10. 
15, 20, 50, 70, 90. They eat a meal, their insulin's, you know, two, 300. Once they can't pump out that much insulin, that's when they're diabetic. So they have just this massive, massive, massive wall of insulin. The vast majority of it is just all night when they're asleep, all day, every day, just constant wall of insulin trying to hold the fuel into storage. Even if their fat cells are overfilled, they're trying to shove that fat in there and keep it from spilling back out. And that's why the insulin goes higher and higher and higher and higher and higher as you get more and more over fat because your cells don't want any fat. And so you're having to force it in there with this insulin. So you can really think about fatness and over fatness as the main contribution to insulin. The mealtime insulin is a drop in the bucket. You know what I mean? It's a drop in the ocean. The ocean is how fat you are. And you want to be thinner with basically eating less calories and doing more exercise. That <laughs> so he would be censored at our obesity medicine meetings, I'm afraid, but you're not supposed to call people fat. You know, that, uh, that you're affected by obesity, you're affected by type 2 diabetes. But that, that aside, it, it, he's making it a little too complicated. You can actually reverse your high insulin levels and, and your diabetes and your obesity by cutting carbs. Now, if you want to and, and do it to a, a level that you need, it might be keto level. Carnivore is a type of a super low carb diet. And to, his, to his, the, the nuance that he's talking about, it's true. I mean, the, if you're someone like him who's not insulin resistant, the insulin going up after the meal is irrelevant, really. It's a drop in the bucket. Although if he didn't eat, car, didn't eat the carbs, his protein wouldn't make it go, his insulin level go up as much. Even though uh, now let's take the context of a carnivore diet where you're not eating really any carbs at all, there might be a little bit of a rise. It's not going to be nearly as much as there would have been after eating carbs and then in the meal, a rise of glucose and or insulin. Remember, insulin goes up in response to the carbohydrate glucose going up. So uh, I, I see this as kind of complicating things, or, or maybe he's taking into account all of those carb eaters and trying to explain to all of those different contexts. I, I just try to keep things simple. So let, let's, say I'm a, let's say I'm a 600 pound, extremely uncontrolled diabetic. My blood sugar is 500 all the time. I have an A1C of 12. I'm horribly diabetic. The amount of glucose in my body is tiny. I still have 300 grams of glucose in my muscles, 100 grams of glucose in my liver, another 20 grams in my bloodstream. That's it. That's it. That's all the glucose in my whole freaking body. I've had diabetes for, that's it. That's it. That's all the glucose in my whole freaking body. I've had diabetes for 20 years. I'm 600 pounds. My sugar's through the roof. All of the glucose and carbohydrate in my body is like less than a pound. And everything else is fat, just fat everywhere. Like my, Every fat cell is maxed out. All my subcutaneous cells are maximum diameter. Visceral fat cells are maxed out. I've shoved as much fat in my liver as I can. I've shoved fat in my pancreas, my heart, my blood vessels. I've got fat shoved in every nook and cranny in my body, and I'm horrifically insulin resistant. And only once I run out of fat storage does my blood sugar start going up because all my cells are refusing glucose, right? And that's when you're diabetic. And it's a disease of being over fat and having too much fat in your body. It can be, yes. Not, it's not 100%. And then people are just looking at their glucometer and just seeing this blood. Or most commonly, yes. Until you get the extra adipose tissue, the extra fat off your body, if that's what's contributing to the insulin resistance, until you get all of that off your body, you may have elevated blood sugars. I, now I see. So... The yes, uh, if a patient of mine cuts all the carbs out, is he, he uses a 600 pound that that's unusual, it's usually 350 pounds uh, in my office. And and it, you may have a, an, an initial improvement in the blood sugars when you cut the carbs out, but you might not have total resolution of the diabetes until your weight has come way down because insulin resistance is from that extra weight as well as the from the food that you eat i totally understand now the the 
problem that Dr. Naiman has here is that he's thinking or describing that this is the only way it can happen, which isn't true, but it is the most common way. So if he's trying to simplify things, I, I understand that now. However, you can have type 2 diabetes and be lean, and it is really the food that's the contributing source. In this blood sugar reading, but it's really, there's just this giant ocean of over fatness and a little bit of glucose floating on top that you're measuring with your glucometer. And then you're like, oh, I'll just not eat carbs and I'll be fine. And people just don't, they don't get it. They don't understand. They do not know what's actually happening. You're making me think about the phrase burn fat to lose fat, or you have to be in ketosis to lose weight. And I feel like I can't say this enough in videos because it's probably one of the most popular questions I get, which is, do you, don't you have to be in ketosis to lose weight? And no, you do not have to be in ketosis to lose weight. And you could even, all weight loss comes down to is not overeating. So you could even be in ketosis and be over consuming fat. And even though you're in ketosis, you were not going to be losing weight if you're overeating. Right. It really just comes down to fat balance at that point. Right. You know, if you're, if you're eating more fat grams and you're burning, you're not losing weight. So it does come down to fat balance. There was one study that I'm aware of, of overfeeding. And it was an individual who did it on himself. Uh, so that's called an N of one study. And, and, but he did it on his own and he put together the information and published it in a paper. And he ate 5,000 or so, or 5,400, something like 5,200 calories per day of three different diets. And he, one of the diet was a keto diet and he gained some weight on it, but it wasn't very much. So when he ate the higher carb diet at the same caloric level, same energy level, he actually gained like three times as much weight. And so it's fascinating. The way the food is handled is very different, but I don't know many people who are going to eat 5,000 calories a day. He was, he's younger, he's active. And so you really have to work hard unless to, to gain weight on a low carb keto diet, unless you're not limiting the butter, the cream, the cheese. These are high ticket, high calorie items. The method that I teach had that already built into it. The method that I teach came from Dr. Atkins and Jackie Aberstein in their office in New York City. And all I did is I said, what do you do? I studied their list. They had already built in from 30 years of clinical practice that these high calorie items need to be limited. The cheese, the creams, the oils, the mayonnaise. And a lot of people are kind of trying to retrofit a, a good approach. And yes, so you don't want to overconsume fat calories. And just to clarify, you're saying that if someone has weight to lose, you don't care if they have a problem with their insulin or not. You don't care if they eat a high carb diet or a high fat diet, as long as they're focusing on protein and they're in a calorie deficit. Absolutely. That is absolutely right. Now, I, I will say that most people end up eating fewer carbs than the standard American diet. Like you pointed out, the average American is doing like one minute of exercise a day and they're eating 300 grams of carbs which is absurd like you know you should be eating probably half of that well i have to editorialize just a little bit because if i was asked to teach you the best way what is the best way is it the way you choose you want to eat uh, dr yancey my colleague here at duke did a study where he allowed people to choose the, the diet, so he randomized people to allow to be able to choose their diet, low carb or low fat, or didn't allow people to choose their diet. And there was no difference in the weight loss between low carb and low fat over that period of time, even though people are able to choose. And, and then if, if you're asking me what's the best diet in terms of head to head competition, low carb, low fat, low fat has beaten out, no, low carb has beaten out low fat innumerable like 20 no it's how often wait sorry it's 20 or at least 20 studies now low carb low fat and, and low carb wins i mean it, 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 that if you look at the score it's not even close so if you so this is being a little more how should i say a little more political a little more um you know allowing people to choose because client satisfaction but if you ask me which diet works the best most commonly first time Every time with no hunger, you know, it's going to be the one I teach. It's been studied as much as a drug would have been for FDA approval now. And yet there's no process for that 
maybe there should be. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't be able to push a diet out unless there, some panel has reviewed the, all of the studies that have been done on it. Wow, that would weed out just about every diet that you see out there. But uh, no, so low carb or low fat, yes, they both can work, certainly. If you want the one that gives the more weight loss than in the clinical trials, then it's low carb, not low fat. But at the same time, nobody's under eating fat. I, I've never seen people who are, who are not eating enough fat unless they're anorexic or something like that. But yeah, it's not like people are not eating enough fat. But yes, people are eating too many carbs in general. And so I agree with carb reduction. You just have some r wiggle room to go back and forth between carbs and fats. And I honestly don't like people to go too low in fat. It's a really bad idea. You're just going to be hungry and not feel well. I don't think anyone should be ever below 20% of their calories from fat, probably 30. But I also feel the same way about carbohydrate. I don't know that it's wise to go all the way to zero. I like, you know, at least 10, 20%, maybe 30%. I do prefer protein dominant scenarios when you're eating this way. But then I think it's, it's probably best to have a little bit of both. Well, I think many people are nervous to have too much protein. I'm five foot, two inches tall, maybe 110 ish pounds, and I eat at least 150 grams of protein each day, easy. But there's all the rumors that too much protein, bad for longevity, the colon, kidney, you're gonna have kidney disease with all that protein. Though I think what you're gonna say is there's, there's no evidence to support this, that's not true. Right, right, that's really not evidence-based. In fact, we do have studies with protein intakes that are you know, about two grams per pound of ideal body weight, and that seems to be fine. Um, we have studies of four grams per kilo. It's, it's, uh, we have studies looking at pretty high protein intakes, higher than what you're doing, and doesn't seem to cause any problems at all. So it's not really evidence-based. I think that's purely mythical. And yeah, somebody would have to show me a study that indicates that because it's just not out there. I'm wondering, what does a day in the life of Dr. Ted Naiman look like? Because, you know, you're working in a hospital. You're also working out, eating good, and you're 51, and you're in great shape. So what does a day in the life of Ted look like? Like, what time are you waking up, working out, going to bed? What do your meals look like? Full day in the life. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so I do like a, like a light intermittent fast. I do basically a 16-8. I think it's, like, microscopically beneficial. I, I would never push it down to, like, six hours, four hours, one meal a day. That's, like, where you really start getting diminishing returns and it starts out. So the, the lingo there, 16, eight, the, that's the hours of intermittent fasting. Uh, you go uh, a certain number of hours without eating anything and you keep your food intake to a certain amount of hours during the day. Is it really relevant what Dr. Neiman eats and drinks? You know, they're, they're, it's not fair that a doctor who promotes something or tells you uh, it has to be doing it themselves and yet this politically advantageous and uh, but the doctor who takes out your appendix they're trained to do that doesn't have to have had appendicitis so so I, I, it's not fair to assume or, or, or insist that your doctor is eating a certain way although it's, it's um, reassuring, I suppose. And so in my career, I didn't talk about what I ate for a long time. And then internet keto comes out and, and, and people are coming and doing the darndest things with oils and expensive things they have to purchase. And I teach a real food based sort of diet and that's what I've eaten as well. So it, it, you know, and I, and the, the looks you get are, oh, really? You're doing it too? It, suddenly it, it takes away some fear uh, and worry. But so let's see what Dr. Naiman's eating. Actually going backwards at a certain point. But I like a light intermittent for 16 8. I skip breakfast just because it's more convenient. It's probably better from a circadian point of view to eat that eight hours earlier in the day. But I'm like in a hurry. I have to get up at the crack of dawn and go see a bunch of patients. You know what I mean? I'm, seeing my first patient at like seven in the morning. So I get up super early and I just skip breakfast entirely and just drink an absurd amount of coffee. Like I drink a ridiculous amount of coffee and just basically push my eating. How many cups a day? Insane and ridiculous amount of coffee. And now that depends. I mean, if, you've, uh, if you're in Europe or if you're a European type city, you may have espresso multiple times. 
He's from Seattle, of course. Uh, the uh, <laughs> the coffee companies in Seattle. There's a coffee shop on almost any corner, and uh, so. But he, he's not specifying how much uh, coffee or, or what he's. But uh, I think he does say black. To like lunch and dinner in a roughly eight hour window. I'm not super religious about it. The first and last meals of that window, I really bookend with protein. So I ate a ton of protein, first meal, last meal. That way I've got, you know, amino acids in the system pretty much 24 seven. I eat lots of super lean beef, you know, the leanest thing I can get in the store, the 90%, 93%, 95%. Lean ground beef. I'm eating skinless chicken breasts. I'm eating uh, skinless chicken thighs, a lot of chicken. I eat a lot of fish, any kind of fish, anything out of the ocean, scallops, uh, shrimp, seafood of any kind. Love it. Every single day, some sort of fermented, low carb and low fat dairy, low fat cottage cheese, low fat Greek yogurt, eating a lot of that. Probably one serving of whey powder in there somewhere a day to like just like one scoop of whey. I'm always trying to eat something that's going to give me weight and volume from the plant kingdom without, without a lot of calories in it. So I like things with soluble fiber in it. It just really fills you up for hardly any calories. Apples. Apples are amazing. I eat probably half a dozen a day. Carrots. Love it. Eating a lot of carrots. Potatoes. I, I air fry. I you know make french fries and air fry them. And I don't put any fat on them at all. And I eat those huge satiety per calorie, like ridiculous. So I'm eating these carbon, these simple you know, single ingredient carbohydrates that have a lot of satiety per calorie. And that's kind of like a side dish. Most of my fats are coming from olive oil, any kind of fruit oil, avocado oil or olive oil, some nuts here and there, but not a not a ton of those. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I drink a lot of non-caloric beverages, green tea, black coffee, diet soda. Like I said, not really afraid of the artificial sweeteners there. And then I think you asked me what time I go to bed. Super late. I only sleep like a couple hours a night. It's like I might go to bed at midnight and wake up at 5.30 or something like that. So I'm doing everything wrong in terms of like protecting my sleep. I'm sure like Dr. Huberman would be upset that I don't have, you know, eight hours in. But yeah, so not really probably prioritizing sleep as much as I should be. Oh, oh and then you asked me, like when I work out, I don't like to work out in the morning. Most people have a higher discomfort tolerance later in the day, late afternoon, early evening. That's when you're best able to handle discomfort. So I can push it a lot harder uh, later in the day. So I like to work out later, like late afternoon, early evening. That's when I'm doing cardio. That's when I'm doing resistance. I try to do basically at least three resistance exercise sessions a week and at least three cardio sessions a week, if not a little bit every day. Wow. You know, people say that I work out a lot, but yeah, you, Good for you. And you had mentioned too that there's diminishing returns when people do more of a condensed eating window. And I do agree if someone's not eating enough in their restricted eating window, then I think that it can be problematic because again, if you're not eating enough, how are you getting in enough of those micronutrients? And then also I find that if people eat just one or two big meals, it can be pretty hard on their digestion. It's a lot of work for the body to have to process all that food. But other than that, is there any other reason why you said that there's diminishing returns? Absolutely. So basically, as people get older, if you're super old like me, the muscle protein breakdown is your biggest concern. So if you don't have amino acids in your system, you're just going to be burning muscle. And so you're going to lose muscle, honestly, if your eating window is too small and you just don't have amino acids available 24 hours a day. So I like a wider eating window, especially for anyone who's trying to either build muscle or preserve muscle from breakdown, which is honestly everybody. So yeah, that's why I don't think one meal a day is optimal. And I guess my last question is, if you could go back in time and give yourself advice, let's say 10 years ago, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, wow. I would probably say just be less religious and listen to everybody, follow everybody, look at what successful people are doing, and then realize that there's a hell of a lot of successful low fat people and vegan people and carnivore people. And you can't really turn a blind eye to any of those just because it doesn't fit your narrative. You know what I mean? So, 
And I think I, if I could go back, I would just be like, hey, be more open-minded. Don't be as dogmatic. Try to zoom out a little. Uh, follow people outside of your silo. That kind of thing. Very interesting. I think what, what we heard was an influencer, nutrition trained coach who is doing carnivore, is trying to understand as much as she can about the metabolism in, the, in that context. And Dr. Naiman now is, is talking a language that goes beyond this really low carb keto level. And that's where you're getting some of this other, you know, eating half a dozen apples a day and ridiculous amount. I, it's interesting. Most people don't talk about how much coffee they're having or if they're having alcohol or, or drinks. And so if you came to me, I would ask you to write down, you know, ask me, I say, tell me what you're eating and drinking over the course of the day. And I ask you to write it out. And it only takes me a minute or less to look it over to make sure you're getting adequate nutrition. And the concern about vitamins in the medical weight loss world, we just always recommend that you take a multivitamin. Because if you're on a medicine that might be reducing the amount you eat, a medical therapy for weight loss, there is a vulnerability for not getting enough micronutrients. So we advocate or recommend that you take a multivitamin. Those who have weight loss surgery and now even these shots that are really strong, they really don't eat much of anything. And that has us concerned in the medical weight loss world because of that micronutrient issue. If you have had bariatric surgery, the ruin y type of gastric bypass surgery, there are nutritional vulnerabilities that happen. 30% of people get iron deficient. Some people have to go to the uh, hospital every month to get iron infusions. The body can't absorb iron in some people after that, uh, that operation. So uh, remember, there are lots of different ways to lose weight. There's different risk to the different things that you choose. There's different expense. You can do it on your own with proper teaching by just changing the food. If you don't have my top 10 tips on how to start keto right, please look in the description below. Please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell so you don't miss out on further content. Till the next time. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And check out AdapterLifeAcademy.com.